Greetings. My name's Mark Short and I'm Bishop of the Anglican Diocese of Canberra and Goulburn. Being visible as a Christian creates challenges, but it also brings opportunities. Being on public display can sometimes make us feel exposed and vulnerable, but it also gives us the chance to show the difference that Jesus makes. The first readers of Peter's first letter stood out against the background of their society, their allegiance to the Lord Jesus, their commitment to following him in every area of life was distinctive. Sometimes that led to misunderstanding, even to ridicule. But listen how Peter reframes their situation in chapter 2, verse 12. Conduct yourselves honorably among the Gentiles, so that although they malign you as evildoers, they may see your honorable deeds and glorify God when he comes to judge. The Gentiles are the nations of this world in all their cultural and religious diversity. Peter is not expecting his hearers to withdraw from the nations, nor is he expecting them simply to be absorbed into the nations like a chameleon changing its color to fit in with the background. No, he calls them to be both present and different in the midst of the nations, living generously so that others may see their faith in Christ and glorify the God whom they serve and worship. You know, in some ways, Christians in Australia have become less visible during our current crisis. On Sundays, our church car parks are empty. Our church buildings are silent. But in other ways, we have become more visible through online worship, through everyday acts of service and generosity in our neighbourhoods. Friends, now is not the time to withdraw from our world, nor is it a time simply to blend into our world. Instead, it's the time to love our world, being present and distinctive as people who follow the Lord Jesus in each and every area of life. Sometimes our presence will be misunderstood. That's okay. But at all times, our presence will communicate the difference that Jesus makes so that others might know the love and grace of God and to come to glorify him as well. Amen. Good morning. Today is Sunday the 10th of May. Today's two readings are taken from 1 Peter chapter 2 verses 11 through to 25 and John chapter 14 verses 1 through to 14. Today's first reading is taken from 1 Peter chapter 2 verses 11 through to 25. Dear friends, I urge you as foreigners and exiles to abstain from sinful desires which wage war against your soul. Live such good lives among the pagans, that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. Submit yourselves to, for the Lord's sake to every human authority, whether to the emperor as the supreme authority, or to governors who are sent by him to punish those who do wrong and to command those commend those who do right for it is god's will that by doing good you should silence the ignorant talk of foolish people live as free people but do not use your freedom as a cover for evil live as god's slaves show proper respect to everyone love the family of believers fear god Honour the Emperor. Slaves, in reverent fear of God, submit yourselves to your masters, not only to those who are good and considerate, but also to those who are harsh. For it is commendable if someone bears up under the pain of unjust suffering because they are conscious of God. But how is it to your credit if you receive a beating 
for doing wrong and endure it. But if you suffer for doing good and you endure it. This is commendable before God. To this you were called because Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps. He committed no sin and no deceit was found in his mouth. When they hurled their insults at him, he did not retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself to him who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross, so that we might die to sins and live for righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed, for you were like sheep going astray, but now you have returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. Our Gospel reading is from John chapter 14, verses 1 to 14. Do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. My Father's house has many rooms. If that were not so, would I have told you that I am going there to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, that you also may be where I am. You know the place where I am going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you are going, so how can we know the way? Jesus answered, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you really know me, you will know my Father as well. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. Philip said, Lord, show us the Father and that will be enough for us. Jesus answered, Don't you know me, Philip, even after I have been among you for such a long time? Anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Don't you believe that I am in the Father and that the Father is in me? The words I say to you, I do not speak on my own authority. Rather, it is the Father living in me who is doing his work. Believe me when I say that I am in the Father and the Father is in me, or at least believe on the evidence of the works themselves. Very truly I tell you, whoever believes in me will do the works I have been doing, and they will do even greater things than these, because I am going to the Father, and I will do whatever you ask in my name, so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. You may ask me for anything in my name, and I will do it. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. A sermon for the fifth Sunday of Easter, entitled Self-Promotion. It's based on the readings from 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 11 to 25, and John 14, 1 to 14, but includes some references up to verse 21. This morning I want to paint three character sketches for the purposes of comparison. As we go along, you might just like to make a mental note of the differences between each character. So let's play Pick the Difference. Sorry, but there will be no million dollar payer at the end of the stories. Let's call the first character Vince Convince. A somewhat dubious and suspect name, if ever there was one. Now Vince was a bit of a vagabond who travelled around the countryside in a small van prior to the era of large retail shopping centres. Vince was what we called a peddler or door-to-door -door salesman who earned a living from commissions based on sales figures. The requirements for this job were the ability to use high-pressure sales pitch and provide expert advice or indeed demonstrations on the wonders of new wave vacuum cleaners. His technique had to be flawless and his knowledge of the product so convincing that people would fall over themselves to get hold of this latest whiz-bang domestic appliance to make cleaning so much easier 
and pushing a straw broom or cloth duster. And no doubt the sales pitch would have addressed matters like suction, special attachments for hard to get at places and the easy disposal of the waste material from a single collection bag. Vince was so convincing that his sales figures, commissions and salary increased dramatically. I suppose to balance the equation we should have a female, so let's invent Prudence Promise. Now, Prudence is right into self-promotion because she desperately wants to be a politician and cure all the problems of society. Prudence is well credentialed, as you can imagine, with a name like that. She is a woman of the utmost integrity. She is a moral and upright person with a kind and caring disposition. But just like Vince, she has to convince the electorate that she has something to offer. No vacuum cleaner this time, just a whole lot of promises designed to fix the perceived mess in the local area. Prudence rolls out a spectacular list of commitments in the pre-election campaign and convinces enough voters to elect her to Parliament. Prudence goes from nobody to somebody within 10 short hours of voting. High ideals, honourable intentions, a bucket load of promises and a spectacular rise from relative obscurity to success in the halls of power. There is, however, a looming problem for Prudence Promise because the Treasury reserves are bare and delivery of her pre-election agenda is in serious jeopardy. Oops, a credibility problem. The third character is often affectionately known as JC to his friends, of whom there are many. However, that nickname is totally demeaning because he is of divine origin rather than the product of human conception. This person had hopes and aspirations for people just like the two previous characters, with one notable exception. He was dealing with eternal values rather than temporal and fleeting issues. Modern use of the term JC is somewhat disrespectful, impolite and impious, so we will desist from further use of this term. Of course, we are dealing with Jesus, the divine Son of God, the one possessed of infinite knowledge and incomparable understanding. When Jesus came to earth as God incarnate, he had a clear agenda and mission to be achieved within a very limited time frame. There was urgency about the messages which he conveyed to the general populace and his closest disciples in particular. His actual time on earth may have been limited, but the message was expansive and complicated. There were no false promises that were undeliverable, and there was no high-tech gadgetry to hoodwink the public into parting with their cash reserves to simplify the menial tasks of life. In John's Gospel, we often find the most intimate accounts of Jesus' relationship and teaching to the disciples. In the early disciples and apostles were to carry the message of Christ into the future. They needed to be fully informed and properly instructed on the purpose of Christ's presence among them. In John 14, Jesus spells out in comprehensive fashion the absolute intimacy and coexistence between God the Father and God the Son. Jesus is here engaged in a lengthy discourse of teaching that may have seemed at the time both unbelievable and highly controversial, especially prior to his death and resurrection. The content must have seemed unfathomable to mere mortals 
because Jesus commences his address with a preamble in which he aligns himself to God. What a comforting way to begin a discourse by such profound death. Depth. Let not your hearts be troubled. This is immediately followed by a summons to belief and a statement of clear intent. I am making the preparations for an eternal inheritance that is undefiled and unfading, kept in heaven for you. The question actually confirms by way of reassurance that this is no phony political promise or hoax, but an imminent reality as Jesus knows exactly the means by which the promise will be executed and come to ultimate fruition. In the actions that Jesus would undertake, there was going and returning. There was preparation and invitation which entailed sacrifice and salvation to make it all possible. Jesus intentionally through his divine foreknowledge, knew that post-Easter he would be able to attract and invite people into an enduring relationship with him and the Father. As God's agent of salvation, Jesus would draw all humanity to himself so that no longer would there be disconnect, but rather an enduring legacy and partnership. What at first may have seemed like self-promotion was in fact eternal truth which was both controversial and confusing to people of that era. Note especially the reaction of Thomas, the lingering doubts, the disbelief and denial that such a course of action could secure an abiding future in God's presence. And maybe there is a little bit of Thomas in all of us as we search for the hard edged proof that something promised is both genuine and achievable. At this point, Jesus does not mince his words and add to the confusion. The great I am of the Old Testament is now a living presence in the person of Jesus Christ. There is no equivocation or distortion in this bold statement of affirmation of Jesus' role in salvation. Jesus says quite categorically that I am the new pathway, the absolute truth, and the giver of life and rebirth to those who come to God. Jesus is virtually saying that by divine decree and divine providence, he is the only agent of reconciliation or salvation, and henceforth, through the death and resurrection, that will be made abundantly clear. It is interesting, and perhaps equally informative, that Thomas is not alone with his doubts and insecurities. Philip also wants Jesus to produce a living sample or specimen of God the Father. Philip's satisfaction levels are unfulfilled. There is so much mystery and uncertainty surrounding these extraordinary claims of Jesus that Philip wants visual proof. Notice the incredible reaction of Jesus to Philip. Have I been with you so long, and yet you do not know me? What seems clear from this passage so far is that Jesus had a tough time of it, convincing even his closest followers of his true identity and divine disposition. He is virtually saying, Now look here, Thomas, Philip, or whoever, I and the Father are one, one mind, one body, and one spirit. All authority is sourced in God, but I am the outward manifestation of the Father, and his mouthpiece to this 
and all future generations. True discernment entails critical analysis of my actions. Now, interestingly, in verses 12 to 21, Jesus does not leave his disciples without hope. He does not abandon them in a malaise of confusion and frustration with little chance of replicating the actions of Jesus himself. Jesus actually encourages them to base all their future actions on the role models that he has provided for them. Jesus is telling his disciples that belief will lead to renewal and revival as they become engrossed in the work of God on earth in the powerful name of Jesus Christ. Although the word prayer is not actually used in this context, The implication that follows from Jesus' teaching is that if you ask for anything in Christ's name, he will do it so long as it doesn't contravene God's divine will, but rather brings glory to the Father. Jesus leaves his disciples with a charge and a further encouragement to action. The disciples are firstly charged or commissioned to keep the commandments of God so that the example they set may be as exemplary as is humanly possible. Beyond that, there is the reassurance that they don't go into this task alone and unaccompanied, for Jesus affirms that the Holy Spirit who proceeds from the Father will be with them in all circumstances. What a wonderful promise to know that the Holy Spirit, that energising and life-giving source of power, will dwell within them. With the earthly departure of Jesus imminent, they are assured that they will not be left desolate upon his return to heaven. And we are meant to be God's modern-day disciples, just as the disciples and apostles of yesteryear in our own individual journeys and pilgrimages through life, each of us are likely to encounter replicas of Vince Convince or Prudence Promise in one form or another. But an encounter with Jesus Christ is clearly far superior. Jesus invites us as the way, the truth and the life to return to God through the agency of the cross and resurrection and to claim not only the promised eternal inheritance but the abiding presence of God's Counselor or Holy Spirit. God's plan far transcends any secular or speculative promise that is subject to the vagaries of the marketplace or political agendas that posture for populist outcomes. Let us pray. Creator, Spirit, Advocate and Counselor, as promised by our Lord Jesus Christ, increase our faith and help us to walk in the light of your presence to the glory of God the Father, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.